welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast. I am here today with uh, the author of The Symmetry of Fish, Sue Cho. So uh, welcome. Yeah, thanks, Jessica. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. And so The Symmetry of Fish is my first book, and it's also my first book of poems. And the way I describe it to a lot of people um, in like a sentence is that this book is about immigration, language, and lore, and thinking about how language you know, affects us in our daily lives in ways expected and unexpected. It was a beautiful book. Um, and I don't want to talk about it past tense. It is. A beautiful <laughs> book. Um, and I, I have so many, so many thoughts. And I just am able to sort of like pick a few um, just to kind of give everybody a little bit of a taste of it. But uh, one thing I really wanted to know is poetry. Um, when did you start writing poetry? Yeah, this is a great question. Um, I always have two answers for this question. I have my joke answer, and my serious answer. And I'm going to start with my fun answer is that um, I first started writing poetry in high school because I thought that I would make a really cool rapper <laughs> with my best friend, Kia. Uh, and it first started when I started taking regular history classes after taking AP courses in high school for a little bit. And I was like, this is difficult. This is not the life for me right now. And so when I was um, taking, I think, U.S. history, I was really bored in that class. I'm not going to lie. And I remember just like for the first time, really understanding what was going on globally, right? With like World War II and everything, right? And in America, I was like, wow, this is really dark. I feel like I need to respond to this with the rap. I don't know, right? And so I, I I remember feeling like really deep and like I was going to change my life. Um, and I would show my friend Kia this. And she, of course, being my best friend, was like, wow, Sue, this is so cool. Um, and obviously, um, we're not rappers or anything cool like that. But, you know, she's a scientist now and I'm a professor. But, you know, I always say like that's when I first started writing and thinking about sound and form really seriously. And then I took a creative writing class in high school, my senior year as a little treat. And I just kind of fell in love with the fact that I could take, you know, anything, anything I wanted, big or small, right, and make it something really important to me. And I just love how I could really focus on like a tiny sentence or a tiny line. And you know, just really focus on that. And I, I think I just really like the microscopic aspect of poetry. Yeah, that's how I first yeah, start writing. Sure. Yeah. So are you going to launch your rap career? Yeah. <laughs> because this, I always say this interview could go in a completely different direction. Yeah. No, I wish. I always say that it is a dream of mine when I am older and perhaps retired that I will be a creative director for music videos or whatever music videos look like in the future. And that I will one day learn how to be a DJ. It's in a poem of mine, actually, that I yes. want to... I want to be an EDM DJ in Vegas when I'm like 80. I think that would be awesome. <laughs> that sounds really wonderful. And I feel like Vegas is like the place where something like that could happen. Yeah, right? Like, yes. You know, Vegas is a place where you you go around and you're just like, did I just see that? <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah, that'll be me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, who's that? Who Who's that 80 80- old DJ <laughs> you heard it here first yes <laughs> yeah um so anyway I I loved that um you know a lot of the poems it was just sort of like a snapshot of just sort of a point in life or just a, a you know some something about um you know uh, the experience um you know growing up um Asian American in America um mm -hmm you know, being the child of immigrants, immigration in general, um, I, I, so, some things that happen that I guess, you know, as like um, 
a, a white person growing up in America in the school system, I might not be like, oh, that's weird until I get older. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you know, that's weird, right? And I'd be like, oh, yeah, actually, now that you phrase it that way. But, you know, like, just sort of like going through it real time and knowing where like the rest, you know, like your your classmates might not see that as um, something that could be not cool. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there were just so many points in the book that were made just so well, but also crafted into the into these poems. So uh, one of the things I just wanted to know is um, what when did what did you like, what were your drivers for deciding where you wrote the poems? Have you been collecting these for a while? Did you sort of just like sit down and you're just like, okay, this poem fits really well here. How did it all weave in this beautiful tapestry? Oh yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of it, I felt really compelled in terms of just organizing these poems, which I had written over the course of many, many years. I would say like seven years, right? Um, and I felt this really strong pull to make everything chronological, right, in a way that really happened. And I started doing that, but it felt really inorganic, ironically, right? Um, and I just really wanted to, when I was putting it together, I wanted to make it kind of reflect how it would feel in this present moment, looking back on it, right? With different like inflections of feeling and tone, right? Sometimes I look back on it and I go, oh, that was a wonderful memory. Yeah, and that's it, right? And sometimes I look up back on it, I go, oh, that was really messed up, right? Kind of like what you were saying, Jessica. Um, and so, yeah, when I was trying to put it together, I felt like it was a constant you know, push and pull between like, oh, am I being like historically accurate, right? With my life, because for me, I feel like it's, you know, with poems, I really wanted to reflect, you know, how I was, but also, you know, it's poetry, you can still, you know, make things up, right? And you can still have a lot of freedom um, with organization and form. I liked the, um, a lot of the names of the poems were really, were really cool but as um I really liked diorama this mm -hmm. um as uh somebody who yeah I I it brought like just the title brought back a lot of uh, memories for me but uh did you want to talk about that one just a little bit because I that one just sort of jumped out at me yeah oh my gosh I'm so happy you uh that one stood out to you um it's I think because it's a smaller one most people don't go toward it often so I'm really excited yeah um I think I mean I don't know about you but I had to make so many dioramas in elementary so many, school so many dioramas <laughs> so many and yeah. I, I don't know I I get the sense um when did you graduate high school if you don't mind uh yeah yeah uh 2010 I think yeah yes. I graduated in 97 and like what you know because I'm thinking to myself now I'm like man we're still we're still doing this, huh? We're still we're still making tons of dioramas. Yes. yes. Yeah. And for me, the impulse of this is I feel like when you think about memory, you wanna kind of frame it in this picture perfect way, right? And every time I tried to do that, there was just everything was breaking, right? I was like, oh, this memory of um everyone had to show off like a hobby they had. And I realized, or collections they had, I realized I didn't have one. So I made one up with stamps, right? That's how the poem opens. And I remember being really sad about it, but also feeling mainly confused. I was like, why do people have collections of things that I have never seen in my life, right? And so um, the stamps were a thing and just every significant like event, right? Thanksgiving, my birthday party, right? the you know the year 2000 you know um and just how all of those big moments in my life were I don't want to say tainted but you know they were influenced um, by misunderstandings um either from me or my parents or the school right or the community and I just loved how um with this poem I could just keep it so small right just like how when you look at you know anyone's diorama or you know any kind of small display you glance at it and you move on 
right? And so I kind of want to give that same effect. And just, you know, we can all glance at it and move on, move on. But if you think about it a little longer, right, you're like, oh, it's not what I expected. And I really love the power of that. Yeah, that's actually a really great way of putting it. That's that's fantastic. Um, and another thing I wanted to, another poem I really wanted to ask you about was Winter in Queens. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because that one was, um, it, it was like you really felt like you were there. And it it was um definitely i think a, a little bit um sadder and mm -hmm. a little bit more you know um emotional um and i just wanted to know about it like i'm reading it and i'm just like i feel like i'm lying on this cold hard floor now and i wanted to know a little bit more about that particular one yeah yeah so I, this was a classic poem where I was thinking about, I was like, well, what do we do over like holidays, right? Where do we go? Because when I think about it now, I remember I didn't know what was happening, but I was very excited to like get in the car and go on this long trip where we got junk food and candy, right? And I, I still love the vanilla cream cookies, the grandma's brand. I really do, <laughs> right? Um, but with that confusion, I remember just being like, why are we like at this church that I vaguely remember? Like, why are we, you know, sleeping here instead of like a motel, right? And there's just, I feel like even as a child, right, we absorb a lot of moods and vibes and feelings, right? And so I never set out to, when I was writing this to be a kind of more like a sadder poem, Right. But I think just looking back and it's just inflected with all these like hopes and things you can't control. Right. Which is, I think, why now that I think about it. Right. Uh, it's not just, you know, this. This issue of the green card floating in the air, but it's also like putting your trust in like, you know, in what prayer can do, maybe. Right. And what, a, you know, what it means going from Indiana to New York, New York. Right. And driving. And just like, you know, thinking about family, right? And all the silences around it, I think is really important to me in this poem. Yeah, it was quietly emotional, I think is mm -hmm. a good way of putting it, which, you know, I think a lot of times um, winter can feel that way too. Um, it's just this really interesting, this interesting balance between silence and just different noise, it, be it, you know, mm. silence. And then all of a sudden you open the door someplace and you're just bombarded by like Christmas carols. Mm. And, you know, some people feel very warm when they hear them, but some people, it brings back other memories and just, you know, the cold weather and just like that the whole like I really like I said like I felt like I was there and mm -hmm. it was great I it was just a really good one um they were all good obviously I'm just <laughs> oh, thank focusing you, you know <laughs> yeah, on yeah. certain ones that um you know hold specific just feelings and smells and I think that that's something that poetry can do really well it just like it puts you in this moment and you're feeling the feelings you're feel and you're smelling the smells um another thing I just I wanted to ask you so I know it's also um the title of the book but it's also a poem so the symmetry of fish first of all when you were uh putting this together were you like were you like this is this is the poem that's going to be the title of this book or did that sort of grow? And then if you want to just talk a little bit about the poem itself. Yeah, um, it's a title, right? Um, the Cemetery of Fish is a title that definitely grew over time. Um, and I actually had, it wasn't, it wasn't an easy decision deciding what to call the manuscript. Um, a part of it, I was like, well, a lot of people are like, what captures the essence of this book? And my gut reaction would be, I don't know, <laughs> right? Um, and I was trying to, I was like, well, maybe I don't want to have a title of a poem be the title of the book because of that, that puts too much pressure on it, right? But over time, like, I felt like the symmetry of fish, right? If you look at a fish one way, 
it's symmetrical another way it's not and that's how I felt about language and translation right and the kind of advice you get as a child that morphs you know as an adult over time when you look back on it and so the poem the symmetry of fish is just it was a memory I had forgotten about for a while right and it you know it wasn't spurred the scene with my mom in the kitchen wasn't spurred by anything in particular but I think she just I don't know felt compelled to give me warnings about the future and who I choose to marry right and it just comes right you know she said you know you can't marry someone like the tail right they'll move away you know can't marry anyone like the head they'll think too much right um and I think she was saying you got to get someone like your dad right who's just you know in the middle right you know sturdy and you know we'll be there right and also I mean and you could eat that part the best like the meat of the fish and so it just really got me thinking of how you try to prepare like the people in your family people in your community to live their best lives in the world right and I thought you know that kind of fits in with what I want this book to do right in unexpected ways like how how we could all learn from each other and live our best lives I mean that's so corny um, but I mean I think that's the goal of yeah, literature really. I mean listen I mean that's certainly the goal I think that people especially post-pandemic Mm -hmm. Our try our, a lot of people are sort of uh, moving towards is that you know you really don't know what's going to happen from one year to the next or one month to the next you know so like you're you you gotta live your best life right now mm -hmm. this is just like I said this is a beautiful book and I, I love like it got um, accolades, I think, from Rox. Um, did it get uh, from Roxanne Gay? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah just yeah. on Goodreads. I was not expecting that. I was just like, I was Googling myself because I was like, getting nervous about the book. And I was like, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as one does. Yeah. Yeah. That was it, it was, um, you know, she said like, you know, that it was no skiffs. It was great. And I'm just like, that's a really fabulous um uh blurb to kind of get so that one so you didn't know you didn't know mm -mm. <laughs> yeah no one asked no one asked Roxanne Gay like I I know that she's really good about reading debut authors books and like you know talking about it but I really I didn't think this book would ever cross her uh bookshelf or her desk yeah it was just a big surprise and yeah um in that one in particular um, felt really good she said all hits no skips because I did I had to do a lot of weeding out of my poems and for each one I had to take out because poems are so short I felt like I was like oh no I'm losing a facet of this vision I have right but I feel like at the end I, I guess it was good or at least you know from one person's perspective it worked out um are you gonna work on another collection at any point in time yeah, yeah, I am. I am. We, we can't help ourselves, you know, when we start writing. But um, I have a thread of poems in here um, about the Chanyagushin, right, which is the ghost from Korean lore. And I'm working in my second book, I think it's going to be um, at least the, the core of that book. And I just imagine, right, there's you know, the Chanyagishin, they're supposed to be like Korean virgin girl ghosts, right? And they died and they're really sad. Well, they usually get murdered. They're really upset because they couldn't serve the men, you know, in their family, most of whom they have yet to meet, right? Um, and a lot of, a lot of the stories, you know, in popular culture, right? They're like these like vampiric, vengeful creatures. They just want to like kill everybody, which sure, I mean, makes sense too but I always wondered what happens after where do they go and I imagine they still have lives to lead um and then I imagine like oh well I imagine there's like a utopia of these ghosts and they all like live together they learn how to be a family together they learn how to be mothers and daughters and talk to each other and so yeah um for the second book that's what I'm working on but I'm finding it it's a bit of a challenge to think about it because well one I'm very scared of ghosts and so ironically, when I'm very scared of something, I have to, I have to just like obsessively think about it and make them not scary. 
Um, and I think that's how I um, thought of uh, these ghosts and these poems. Um, and two, it's just, it makes me feel very emotional whenever I think of these group of, of ghosts, right? Um, trying to, you know, live the life they were robbed of. And it just makes me really sad. And I feel like every time I try to write, I have to, you know, pause and I'll come back to it later. And I, you know, the cycle repeats itself. But yeah, so hopefully, yeah, that's that's what the core of the second book will be. That sounds really cool. Have you ever thought about making, um, like making the leap to fiction, perhaps? Oh, yeah, I I have, I have thought about it. Um, but, you know, as a poet, prose scares me. It's a very daunting task. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so for me right now, um, I'm going to see how this um, sequence of ghost poems go. It's going to be very narrative. I love narrative poems. I love the power of the story and poems. Yeah, as you could probably tell in the book. Um, and then hopefully um, I could expand it from there because I think I think there's a lot we can say about, you know, gender and sexuality uh, in American culture, right, too, uh, with these ghosts. And yeah. yeah, I'm getting so excited about thinking about them again. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm like thinking about this and like, as you're talking about it, I'm like, I would totally read that as a novel too. That yeah. would be really cool. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to chat with us. This was wonderful. Um, and uh, we hope to see a lot more from you. Yeah, thank you, Jessica. And thank you for the attention you gave these poems and the book. It really means a lot to me. It was it was hard to pick which ones to focus on. So I sort of had to, at one point, just be like, okay, let's think about just different points that different ones are making and, yeah. you know, kind of build it out from there uh, because they really are all good. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And I love the ones you chose. Those are, yeah, I... I don't think anyone's ever asked me about diorama that uh, poem. So I'm really happy. Impossible. I can't imagine that like dioramas were not a thing. If they're still if they were still making them in 2010, every single person should have just been drawn to that poem by the title alone. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you'll start the trend and then now I'll have to like make dioramas again. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. Like, oh my gosh. Now I'm like wondering if my kids are going to make dioramas now. I'm like, Ooh, maybe <laughs> I'm ready for this. Let's do this. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You've learned your lesson. I oh. feel like me too. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, this was Jessica with Syosset Libraries Turn the Page podcast. Our guest today was Sue Cho. And we, the author of uh, The Symmetry of Fish, a wonderful book of poems, and we are going to close this chapter. It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.